as we said yesterday, we are having a dialogue, which means conversation between two people, or with many, who are interested or concerned with certain problems of human beings and want to go into them deeply with care and affection, not with any form of assertion or argument. And the dialectical method is investigating through opinions to find out the truth. So we are not dialectically investigating. We are, as two friends, talking over together their human problems and hoping to solve them and to discover truth. And I'm afraid there is a great deal of misapprehension that we are trying to find a technique to, to, to truth, a technique which means learning the method, practicing a method, learning a certain form of technique that will help you or another to come upon this truth. We are not advocating or saying that there is any technique to truth. Please be very clear on this matter. Technique implies learning a method. I mean, to go to the Mars as they have done, which is the most extraordinary feat, you need a great deal of technological knowledge, a great deal of accumulated knowledge of the know how. But as truth is a pathless land, please bear this in mind, it's a pathless land. You can't lay down a line, a direction, a path to it and practice it, discipline yourself, learn a technique. So please bear in mind that we are not giving or offering or telling a a technique, a method, a system. We are already so mechanically minded, our minds are already sufficiently mechanistic, and by practicing a technique, a verbal repetition, silence, you know, all the whole business of all the all techniques, will somehow unloosen or free the mind from all mechanistic activity. I'm afraid it won't. What we are saying is that you must have the interest, the drive, the intensity to find out, find out for yourself, not be told how to do it. Then what you discover is something yours, then you will be free from all gurus, from all techniques, from all authority. Please bear that in mind while we are having a dialogue about these matters. So what shall we talk about or have a dialogue this morning? Shall we talk about understanding? Understanding. The nature of understanding. Yesterday we talked about the possibility of not being heard. 
Oui, bonne soeur. Yesterday, you talked about the possibility of not being heard. And I think the problem is that if people don't want to be heard, it is necessary to be completely open and vulnerable. But people fear that if they are vulnerable, then they get hurt. So that maybe we can talk about fear to be completely open. And the sense we are afraid, the questioner says, to be vulnerable, to be open. Because the more you are vulnerable, the more likely you get hurt. And so we fear to be open. To you see, the word vulnerable means, doesn't it, to like a leaf in the wind. It's vulnerable to Wins. So, could we discuss that? Be pardon. The responsibility of a human being, with regard to the images he forms about another. Could we discuss that? The responsibility. I should like to investigate with you the relationship of speech to the dialogue, the relationship of speech to the silent mind. The relationship of speech, words, thought, to and silent mind. I'm afraid I haven't heard it, sir. Would you louder? I'm of, what is the question, sir? I haven't got it. Big pardon? How can we live without a motive? Is that the question? Yes. How can we live without a motive? Now that's enough for the time being. Let's. Gentlemen wanted to discuss or have a dialogue about understanding. The relationship between speech, word, thought and silence. The responsibility of not forming a, an image <coughs> in relationship. That was the question that was put. And huh? and to be vulnerable. Can we live without a motive? Now, what shall we take of those questions, one of those questions, so that we can think or observe or trace it right to the end? not be di diverted to in other directions. Go to the very end of one question, which may include all other questions. Question Understanding. Understanding. Understanding, right. I think that's good too. I would take that too myself. <laughs> Understanding. What do we mean by that word, understanding? Please go slowly into it, not quickly. 
to understand something, what is implied in it? Is it a verbal understanding, a comprehension through verbal description, a comprehension through affection? I like you, I'm friends with you, I tell you something, therefore you understand what I am saying? Or is it a, an insight into something which is rather complex and confused? Or is un- how does understanding take place? You understand my question? Does it understanding take place through verbal communication, which is description? Because you and I, if we are speaking English, then it's something French, Italian, whatever it is. Through verbal communication and the description. Is there an understanding or an insight, or does understanding take place not merely through words, not merely the description, but going beyond the word, which means both you and the other are free of the verbal structure which is the nature of thought and penetrating and having an insight. You understand? When we talk, I understand uh, how the cars run. That's very simple. I've observed it, I've undone it, I've played with it, and I know how it works. I understand how to climb a mountain. I know. But we are talking of understanding psychologically, aren't we? Deeply. Not the mere worldly understanding, but much more the understanding which brings about an insight. An insight means having a sight in something. which then becomes the Truth, and I can never go back from it. You understand? When I understand something, which means I have an insight into that, and therefore that very insight will wipe away any misunderstanding, any complexity. It is You have clear sight in that. Therefore, understanding implies, does it not, a mind or a brain, the whole structure of the mind, listens not only to the word, but goes beyond the word and sees the deep meaning of that particular statement. And then there is an insight, and then you say, I understand it. I got it. So it is insight implies a mind that is quiet, willing to listen, go beyond the word, and observe the truth of something. Say, for instance, I make a st- the speaker, speaker makes a statement like, the ending of sorrow is the beginning of wisdom. 
You understand? He makes a statement of that kind. Now, how do you receive it? I wish to. I wish that sorrow will end. No, how do you. No. I, please listen to me. The speaker makes that statement. The ending of sorrow is the beginning of wisdom. How do you receive it? What is your reaction to that statement? Do you make of it into an idea, an abstraction, and with that abstraction, which is an idea, try to understand what he said? Or you listen – that is, I've commun- you listen to the word, the meaning of the word, and go beyond the word and see the truth of that statement, or the falseness of that statement. Not how to end sorrow, or how to have wisdom, but whether that statement conveys a truth or a falsehood. To have to perceive the, to observe the truth or the falsehood, your mind must be quiet, and then you have an insight into it. Then you say, "By Jove, how true that is!" You. So, in the same way, understanding implies having an insight into a problem. Right? So that you you go beyond all arguments, all dialectical approach, you it is so. It is immovable. You like say for instance it's the speaker says, there is no technique to truth. Truth is a pathless land. He makes that statement. He has made it fifty years ago. Hmm? And how do you receive that statement? Go on, sir. How do you receive that statement? This is a dialogue. Do you receive it with opinion, saying, oh, no, that can't be true, because everybody talks about technique, hmm? the method, the system, and this man comes around and says, there is no tr- path, there is no technique to truth. So you say, well, who is right in this? Is this man right or is that man right? Hmm? So are you arguing, comparing, judging, or do you listen to that statement, not knowing what is right and wrong, because you don't know. Actually, you don't know. Ten people or a million people have said there is a technique, and some person comes from and says, there is no technique whatsoever. How do you know? You understand? This man may be totally wrong. So he said, and he explains a technique implies practice, time, a mechanistic progress, process. Our minds are already mechanistic enough, and you are making it more mechanistic. Right? So he explains all that. And you still say, well, Thousand people do have techniques. So, do you balance these two and then say, well, I prefer that rather than that? Or you receive what is said with complete objective silence, quietness, not knowing what is true. And when you listen quietly, 
which means complete attention, then you discover, have an insight into what is being said. Then it is yours, not mine. I don't know if you. That is to find out what is true and what is false. To find out the truth in the false. Right? So your mind must be extraordinarily open, vulnerable. Right? Otherwise you will, you don't know. I wonder if, I'm, if we are understanding each other. You see, is love an intellectual thing? Technique is an intellectual thing. A method is an intellectual affair. And can you love through a technique? Right? Can you? By practicing being very nice, very kind, very gentle, you know, all the rest of it. And can at the end of a year, have, after having practiced a method, will you love? Right? It's impossible, isn't it? So, you, why do you say no? What? It was a That's right. So why do you say that? Now, just a minute. Why do you say that? When I said, "Will there be love if you practice kindness, gentleness, non-violence, etc., etc., etc.?" Will you have at the end of it love? No. Will you have it? No. No. What makes you say no? What makes you say no? Do go, listen to it carefully. What? No, sir. You don't ask. Listen to me. Hmm? We said, is love? Can love come into being through any form of intellectual effort as technique? Hmm? And you say no. What makes you say no? no but listen carefully. What makes you say no? You have an insight that technique is a method. It's an intellectual affair. You say, how can that be lo- produce love? You follow? There is instinctive response. Now, if someone says, listen carefully, the observer is the observed, hmm? the observer being the past, and what he observes is through his past background, therefore what he sees is seen from the background. The observer is the observed. He makes a statement. And you say, I don't understand that. Right? That's, I, do, I can't see it. Please tell me in a different way. So the speaker says, this, the thinker is the thought. The, if there is no thought, there is no thinker. Right? Right? And why do you say right? Because you see the ob- you see the obvious thing, don't you? And he says further, the experiencer is the experience. And he said the experiencer must recognize the experience. Otherwise, there would be no experience. So recognition implies the past. So the past experiences what it wants, or experiences that which he has projected. And you are quite right. 
So you instinctively, rather, when it's put very clearly, you say, perfectly right. So understanding takes place when both of us have a common language, the meaning of the, the words have the same meaning for you as well as for me, and we are talking about the same thing, with the same interest, with the same intensity, then there is a direct communication, right? Come on. Only with words. We have been through that. Words are only means for communicating. But you must go beyond the word. We've said that ten times. So. Is a monkey. Ah, a monkey. Oh yes. Now there is a there is a very famous story. I don't know if it won't be told. Very famous story of a monkey going to the Buddha, and he said the monkey says to the Buddha, "I have practiced meditation for the last twenty years or fifty years." And I can do most extraordinary things. I can go right around the world in a few seconds. And, he, and the Buddha is stretching out his hand, the monkey is sitting there. And he said, Do it. The monkey says, I'm going to make tremendous effort, go right around the world. And monkey opens the eyes, he says, You are still there. <laughs> You get it? All right. Right. One has built a wall around oneself. The questioner says, and one desires to jump over that wall, because that wall becomes a prison, that wall becomes a, a wall of resistance, which implies isolation, bitterness, lack of love and all the rest of it. And so the verbal description makes you want to jump over. Just a minute, right? The verbal description that you are a prisoner, enclosed by your own desire not to be hurt, you have built brick by brick this wall, and the speaker describes the wall, the effects of the wall, the bitterness, the sorrow, the isolation, the loneliness, and from that violence and all that, he describes it. And you say, I want to get over that wall. Which means you have no insight into what, what has made you build that wall. All that you are concerned is get over. And you will never get over. Whereas, if you had an insight into the whole movement of hurt, resistance, uh, isolation, see the whole picture, observe the whole picture, then the wall doesn't exist. Ah, ah. There is no other. I'm, that's why I want. Please, let's be clear what we are saying. Having an insight means complete observation of the whole movement of hurt. We are taking that as an example. You 
complete mo- un- the understanding of the complete movement of hurt. Wait, why? I'll tell you. Let me finish what I'm going to. I'll tell you later why. Do we understand the, or observe the whole movement of hurt? The whole movement, not just building a ball. Why we are hurt? The image that we have about ourselves, and that image is me, and then I am hurt, and then I build a wall around myself not to be hurt more, because I see if I am vulnerable, I get hurt more likely, so I build a wall around myself, and by building a wall around myself, I become, I resist, and in resisting, I become more and more enclosed, hmm? more and more isolated, and from that isolation I feel desperate. Hmm? And I see you who are not desperate, I am angry with you, I become bitter, all the rest of it follows. Do I see, is there an observation or an awareness of this whole movement of hurt? One moment, sir. I understand, I understand your question. First let me finish with this. Do you observe, are you aware of this whole movement? <laughs> or you are only partially aware of it? And therefore you say, how am I get over it? When there is a partial awareness of this movement, then the reaction is, tell me how to get over it. Then the how becomes the method. But when there is a total observation of this whole movement of hurt, there is no how, you see it. There is an insight into it. You, you, you got it? Now the question is, the lady asks, why do I, why do I bother with it? Why should I go through all this business of insight and awareness? <laughs> because human beings are violent. Human beings are bitter. Human beings are, are enclosed, tight. Mm-hmm. Everything is self-centred. The more activity, the more self-centred it becomes, in the name of God, in the name of social work, in the name of etc. But the thing becomes tighter and tighter and tighter, and therefore more and more anxiety, greed. And a man observing this says, well, why should I live that way? What? Ah, no, 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 you, there is no... See, you have not... Forgive me for repeating, I'm afraid you haven't understood. I said, insight is not a movement. It is direct perception in which there is no movement. Are you, are you have listened to what I said? Ah, no, 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 please. Un- Let her go, please. None. I said no movement, not somebody moves. No, you haven't. What? No, I said, please, madam, 
We are old friends, please, we have known each other for many years. <laughs> we are saying, when I insight I me means non-movement, right? Huh? Nowhere. <laughs> no, you are missing my whole point. Please. No, madam, you haven't understood. Please, you are not listening. Forgive me for saying so, but you are not listening to what is being said. Look, I'll say s something which is very applicable to you and to me, and words, description have no meaning, right? And you say then, I understand it. Hmm? That understanding is non-movement, isn't it? You have understood it. What? Non capito. There we part company. What? She says, There we part company. Oh, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> don't let's part company, which is what everybody does when they don't agree or understand. Just a minute, please. Don't, don't, don't use we part company. That's the worst. I mean, um, just listen. Just listen to what I've got to say. I know what you're saying. I've understood what you're saying. You haven't understood what I'm saying. I've understood what you're saying. I've understood it. Please believe me. Don't ever say we part company. That's the first thing to learn. That means you and I are opposed to each other. You and I, or me, or two human beings, when they say we part company, it's the worst thing to say. But but please listen, you're not listening to me, you're listening to yourself. Don't let us ever come to that point when we say, you go north, I go south. Because what we are trying to do here is to understand our human problems, to find out what is true and what is false. Not my truth or your truth or your falseness or my fault. What is truth, which is non-personal, it's not yours or mine, it is true. And that's what we are trying to understand. So, if you and I are concerned with, with concerned in, with the inquiry into what is true, there is no party. We may go slower, somebody may go faster. But they, we are on the same path, we are on the same direction or no path. So please, that's the most ugly thing to say to somebody else, we part. It's like a divorce. Leave, 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 leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. Yes. Insight and knowledge, can we discuss that? And also there are lots more to discuss, as that lady pointed out, the responsibility of image hmm, making and living without an image. 
and also about vulnerability and and to live without a motive. All these questions are involved. We began by asking, because that was the first question we all agreed to, which was, what is understanding? If you are... if I am fixed at a certain point and you are moving away from that point, there is no understanding between you and me, hmm? because I am fixed in my opinion, in my belief, in my experience, in what I think. Hmm? And therefore, communication between you and me comes to an end, because I, the speaker has no belief, literally has no belief, no opinion, he is only investigating, penetrating, tracing out. But if you are, take a stand, then it's finished, you are not investigating. We said in investigating into what is truth, and to enquire into that, we must not only understand the verbal meaning, English or French or whatever it is, German, then go beyond the word, and you can only be, go beyond the world, word when you understand thought which lives on words. You understand this? Which lives, breeds on words. And to go beyond that is to have real communi communion which then perhaps can bring about an insight. That's what we say. An insight into what is false and what is true. And that requires very alert, capable observation, not based on prejudice. So we'll, discuss, we'll go into another question, which is, human beings get hurt because they think they are vulnerable, because they are sensitive. And the question is, does not vulnerability bring more hurt? And therefore, don't be vulnerable, don't be open, because then you get more and more and more hurt. Right? That was one of the questions. Now, what makes us, what brings about hurt? We said it brings about, hurt is, comes into being when there is an image of myself and that image gets hurt. That's fairly simple, right? I have an image about myself that I am a great man or a silly man and whatever it is I have image about myself, that image gets wounded, that image is me. The me and the image are not different. Now, as long as I have an image about myself and myself is that image, getting wounded is inevitable, right? Obvious. Huh? Because that's right, because there is resistance, because I have assumed a position, I have assumed a, an image which is very pleasant to me, and when you come and disturb it, I get hurt. So if there is no image, there is no possibility of getting hurt, right? We went into the question of how to go beyond the image. We went into it the other day very carefully. Now, to have no image is to be completely vulnerable. 
It is only please listen carefully. It is only when there is a resistance, then there is hurt. But there's a question. Is it possible that there is an image which does not resist? You can't. If I, if you have an image, it must resist. That's natural. It's like having a wall. A body. But you go back to the body. That is, the organism can tolerate so much and no more. All right. A body, the organism, the biological thing, can tolerate fear up to a certain point. Beyond that, it it can't tol it can't hold. It goes to pieces. So, the, then you have to make the body healthy, right food and right exercise and all the rest of it. So, what is the question, sir? When the image is gone, I am nothing. That's right. And when I am nothing, nothing can hurt me. No, not nothing can hurt me. No, you, I, 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 <laughs> that's a problem of language. I understand. Sir. Only vegetables can uh, can live in that state. I am not a vegetable. Please, I have lived for this entity has lived for over eighty years. There has been all kinds of insults. Every kind of devotion, every kind of flattery, every kind of usage of words, call, calling the person all kinds of names, ugly names, terrible, and no image, and therefore never been hurt. I am not a vegetable. You may say, "Oh, but you're, that's an illusion you are living in." Maybe. I said, no, I've investigated how illusions come, which means sensation plus desire plus thought image. When you have that process, there must be bound to be illusion. I have not that. I've gone into this thoroughly. So I am not a vegetable, and other human beings can do this. So let's proceed. So where there is image, there is hurt. When there is no image at all, and that is, that is essential, that is possible, and it is possible only when you understand the whole movement of building images, having an insight into the building of the image, then there is no building image, and then only there is complete vulnerability. It's only when there is partial vulnerability, then there is hurt. Then go to the next question, which is, what is our responsibility to another in this image-making? Right? And we'll ask, after finishing this, we'll go to that question, can one live without a motive in life? What is responsibility? What is one's human responsibility with regard to another when both of them are building images about themselves? You understand? You are building an image, and I am building an image. And our relationship is based on those images. Right? If you have observed yourself for two seconds, this is an obvious fact. I live with, with a human being, and with that human being, I, after living, I begin to build up an image. Hurt, irritation, pleasant companionship, words follow. I gradually, through years, I have established a strong image, as the other person has established strong image about me. So there is this relationship is between these two images. Whether you like it or not, it's a fact. Then, if one of them is not free, is free of all image making, 
literally all image-making, what is his responsibility towards the other? That's the question, as far as I understood. That's right? Is that right? I I don't quite hear it, please. Louder. She says one is not totally free of images. Huh? She says one is not free, actually, totally of images. Yes. She, one is not actually completely free of image making. So we have to be concerned with that, not the responsibility. We have to be concerned why we build images. It's fairly simple. Because we have fear. Huh? We have fear. No, no, don't introduce. <laughs> Why do we build images? Why do you have an image about yourself? You have an image about yourself, haven't you? Huh? Don't be shy. It's simple. <laughs> you have an image about yourself. How does it come into being? What? We try to compensate for our inadequacy, and therefore we build images which make us appear and feel adequate. No, sir. You have an image about yourself, not you, sir. I'm not personally asking you. You have, pers- you have an image about yourself. How? Why? Why do you have it? And how does it come into being? By a thought. Huh? By a thought. No. Well, look at it simply. From childhood, huh? you are told you are not as good as your brother, hmm? that you are not as clever as your elder brother. So you begin. You begin slowly to build the, the image. Your friends help you, and you help your friends to build this image. Society helps you, your parents help you. So gradually, the school, university, college, you build this tremendous image about yourself that you are clever or not clever, that you are this or that. And the... So you have an image. And one very rarely is aware of this. Right? One is not aware of this image. That image is me, and one is not aware of it. Now, to become aware of it is the first thing. Can you become aware of it? Not say, I don't like it or like it. Be aware of the image that you have about yourself. Can you? When I'm hurt, yes. Now, now. Not when, I, when you are hurt. Now I am asking. Oh, for God. You said you have an image. So don't let's beat around the bush. It's so simple. Come on. Madam, we are not talking of love. Look, be So, to become aware of that image, then are you aware of it as though it were different from the observer? Please answer this question simply. 
Are you aware of that image as something different from you who are looking at it? Huh? Is the observer different from the image? Huh? Naturally not. Hmm? So, the observer is the image, right? But if you see this, the image vanishes. Huh? Not if you see, not if do you do you see oh my goodness, do you see or have an insight that the you are who think are different from the image? When you have an insight you then say, I am the image, obviously. Now careful, just go slowly from here. You are the obs- observer and you discover for yourself that the image, the observer is the observed, the observer is the image, then what takes place? Don't guess, don't say, yes, if that happens, this will happen, that's no meaning. What takes place when the observer realises what he is observing is himself, so the observer is the observed. That is, having an insight into that, then what, what happens? There's no more conflict. No, go slowly, sir. Don't, don't, no, there is something. Go slowly. What takes place? Attention. Observation. Huh? You are not watching it. You now you're too complete. You make keep it simple, sir. Uh, when it is very simple, you make it very complicated. Uh, you, you are You are lost. You are lost there. You lost the something or other. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look at it, sir. Please look at it. This is really most important. Once you have this key, the real thing that you have, then you will find out so much. When the observer is the observed, the experiencer is the experience, the thinker is the thought, hmm? what has taken place? What has actually taken place? The division between the two has come to an end. Right? Before we had this division, the observer said, I am different from the observed. Right? So, in that division there was conflict. Right? The observer then says, I must do something about the observed. I must control it, I must suppress it, I must run away from it. So, when the observer sees he is the observed, conflict comes to an end. Right? When the Arab realises he is the Israel, this war is over, you understand? So, when the observer realises he is the observed, then the conflict, the division, the struggle, all that has come to an end, because he can't do anything else. He is there. Right? You've understood? He is there. Therefore, the conflict has completely come to an end. When a, when a Hindu realises he's the Muslim, you understand, he may, the Muslim may have different customs, but essentially he's himself, then, you know, he says, for God's sake, don't let's fight, don't let's be silly. So, conflict comes to an end. Hmm? 
Is that a fact with you? Or you are accepting my fact? So if it is a fact to you, then you have come to a way of living in which there is no conflict whatsoever, which means no opposite. You understand? You understand this? No opposite, that is, opposing desire, hmm? wanting to do this and not wanting to do that, which is in opposition to each other. When you, are, when you realise desire has different objects but is still desire, then the opposition goes. goes. You are following all this? There is only desire. Then what is desire? Then you go into it and see, desire can, comes into being only when there is sensation plus thought and desire. From that arises the image. I wonder if you follow all this. Sensations, thought, desire, then the image making. I see that car, observe him, sensation, then the thought says, how nice, if I could drive it, desire, and the image, which is me sitting in the car and having fun. Right? So, As long as there is image making, there must be no, there must be hurt. When there is no image making, there is no possibility of being hurt at all. And to see, have an insight into that frees you from image making. The ne and the next question is, which you, the lady didn't put, which I'm going to put. What is the relationship between two people when one has really no image and the other has image? What is then the relationship between the two? You understand? It can happen, you understand? It does happen. You may be married and your wife may be free of image making. My God, oh, that'd be marvelous. <laughs> And she would call it marvelous if you had no image. So, what is your, what is her relationship to you? She who has no image, and you have image. Come on, it's your, it's your responsibility, not mine. Huh? What is that? We can't answer. Quite right. She could love me. Huh? She could love me. Ah, you don't know. You see, you've already, you've already found an image. If you have no image, what is your responsibility to the world? to another, and what takes place when there is no image in this relationship of human beings? You don't know, right? That is the truth, you don't know. I, any formation is just an image-making, you don't know. See, remain with that fact that you don't know which is an extraordinary discovery. You understand, sir? We always have an answer. But to say oneself, I really don't know what would happen if there was no image-making. But I'm going to find out. You follow? You can, look, 
you can when you start with certainty you end up in doubt when you start without any certainty you end up completely certain you understand so you don't know from their move find out whether you can be free of image and what is implied and the responsibility to us. You follow? It is a marvellous thing that's growing, flowering. You discover it. And the next question is, can one live without a motive? That is, we said, where there is a motive, there is a direction. Right? The direction set by thought. Right? I have a motive of wanting to get rich. Thank God I haven't got it, but suppose if I have it, I have a motive. Therefore, all my life is directed towards that particular thing, getting money, because then I can have fun, I can have travel, I can have house, follow all the rest of it. So we are traditionally we are traditionally trained, brainwashed to have direction. Heaven. Jesus, Buddha, whatever direction, economically, socially, religiously, we have trained to have directions. Right? And so we don't know how to live without a motive. Then we ask, is it possible to live without a motive? Right? Not knowing, we can find out. I don't start by saying, I mustn't have a motive, that's silly, when I have got it. But to say, well, I have got a motive, I see what is implied in a motive, a movement in a certain direction, pleasant or unpleasant, profitable, not profitable, worthwhile, not worthwhile, and so on. The direction is set by thought, which is desire, image, sensation, and particular direction. That is the motive, operation. And we are trained traditionally, educationally, socially, in every way, even religiously, you follow? You have directions. Having directions, motives, then you can find out why, why thought sets a direction. You understand my question? Are you following this? Why thought sets a direction in life? Direction means not comprehension of the whole. Right? It's like looking at a map. Please, give me five minutes, don't get tired. If you are tired, then go to sleep and don't listen. But keep awake for five minutes at least. What's the time, Mira? It's um, 20 to 12. We'll finish with this. Why do we have direction in life? Because one of the reasons is it gives security. At least thought assumes it gives security. Right? If I have no motive, I don't know what to. Good Lord, I will be lost. So, the fear of getting lost, fear of not being secure, both financially, psychologically, and physically, thought says, I must have a direction in life. 
So it sets a direction, hmm? which means pushing away all other things. Hmm? Like one of those athletes we saw in the Olympic Games is completely in one direction, diving, um, running, whatever it is, completely absorbs, trained, concentrated, and the rest of life is just, you know, politics, religion, everything is a side issue. There is completely secure. So thought sets a direction in order to, fi- to be both biologically and psychologically secure. That is a fact, right? So it discards the, the whole map of life. It only sees one direction which is towards that particular village and the rest is denied. So when you have a direction which is traditional, accepted as normal, then there is division between the one who has the direction going north and the other fellow going south, or south-east, south-west, you know, break it all up into fragments. You follow? The moment you have a direction, you are breaking up life into fragments. I want a few... I just see it now. I've got an insight to it. You understand? No, see it for yourself. That is, the moment you have a direction, you have broken up life into fragments. So your life has become a fragment, because you have a direction. Got it? You see it? So, and the question then, the question is, can I live without direction? You understand? I see the whole of the map, and the map says there is no motive, no direction. Now, just a minute. I'll go slowly into this. I said, when there is direction, there is the fragmentation of life, of living. That's clear. Fragmentation implies conflict. You that direction, I that another direction, she another direction. Hmm? So we are all breaking up, and therefore there is no cooperation, except for profit and all the rest of it. So there is always conflict when there is fragmentation. Right? Hmm? Can we go on? And I want, and the mind say, is it possible to live without fragmentation, without direction? It can only say that when it has seen, has an insight into the fragmentary way it is living, because it has got a direction. You have understood what I am saying? If I see, observe, aware that having a direction implies fragmentation, where there is fragmentation, there must be conflict. Arab, Jew, Hindu, Muslim, follow? Um, Catholic, Protestant, the whole business of living, where there is a direction, there is fragmentation, and therefore division, and therefore conflict. Do you have any insight into this reality? It's a reality, right? It's an actual, factual, daily reality, where I have a direction. I, am a, I want to be the Prime Minister, and, you, and so on. You follow? So there is conflict between you and me. 
Where there is division, there must be conflict. That's a law. Have any insight into that? Then only I can say, can I live without motive? Not before, because there's no meaning. So I'm, I'm going. I don't know. You understand? I don't say, well, I can or cannot. I don't know, but I do know where I have a direction. There is fragmentation, conflict, and all the rest of it follows. So uh, that I am fully acquainted with. It's, I'm familiar with it every day of my life. From that I ask myself, because I have an insight into that, I ask myself, is it possible to live without a motive? I really don't know. Hmm? But I do know the other, but I don't know this. So I'm going to inquire. I'm going to watch. I'm watching. There is an observation in my action. In my speech, hmm? right? Whether I have a motive, and I say yes, I have got a motive there. Why? So I be, you follow? I begin to bulldoze it, <laughs> bring it all out. So at the end, I can say, I have no motive. Do you know what that means? No conflict. No fragmentation, a life which is whole, healthy, sane and holy. Then only you can say this, but to say it before means nothing. Huh? Huh? What is your What? I said, there is no motive. I said, I have no motive. So that's a façon de parler. <laughs> Quickly say, say it. Actually, what it means, there is no motive for living. L- hmm? Know what that means? Then that means real compassion. You understand? We meet again tomorrow.